Order. We now come to the backbench debate on the definition of Islamophobia. To move the motion, I call Wes Streeting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg to move that this House has considered the definition of Islamophobia, and um, I wish to begin at the outset by thanking the Backbench Business Committee uh, for agreeing to this debate and the Government for providing time for us to discuss it this afternoon. On 15th of March, a gunman walked into the Al Noor Mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, and opened fire. During the course of his killing spree there and at the Linwood Islamic Centre, 51 people were slaughtered in their place of worship for no other reason than their killer had decided that their faith meant that they deserved to die. Hatred against Muslims does not begin with the sound of gunfire breaking through the peaceful calm of a place of prayer. It begins with simple prejudice that can go unchecked and unchallenged in our schools, our workplaces and our communities. It is amplified on the pages of national newspapers. It is legitimised by political leaders who use Muslims as punchlines and bigotry as a vote winner. Just over 20 years ago, the Runnymede Trust published its seminal report, Islamophobia, a challenge for us all. That they felt compelled to publish a follow-up 20 years later entitled Islamophobia, Still a Challenge for Us All, reflects our collective failure to listen, learn and lead. The all-party parliamentary group on British Muslims, which I am proud to lead with the Right Honourable Member for Broxtow, is determined to rise to this challenge. That's why we produced a groundbreaking report proposing a working definition on Islamophobia entitled Islamophobia Defined. We entered into this with an open mind about whether Islamophobia was the correct term. It was clear from the evidence we gathered, including powerful testimony from victims, that Islamophobia is widely used by Muslim communities, it is considered to be useful, and that what we're up against goes much wider than anti-Muslim hatred. It is structural, often unconscious bias. We argue that Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. It is true that Islam is a religion, a set of beliefs and ideas, and that Muslims are a set of believers from many races. But racism is a social construct. As Dr Omar Khan of the Runny Me Trust has said, and I quote, defining Islamophobia as anti-Muslim racism properly locates the issue as one in which groups of people are ascribed negative attitude, attributes which can lead to a wide range of experiences, either as unconscious bias, prejudice, direct or indirect discrimination, structural inequality or hate incidents. Of course, many Muslims do belong to an ethnic minority in the United Kingdom, and even those who do not, white converts for example, experience a form of racism. As Tell Mama, an organisation that does excellent work in recording hate crime against Muslims told us, and I quote, any definition must consider how racialization of Muslim identity means, for example, that white convert, converts are verbally abused with epithets like Paki. <coughs> Alongside our definition, we produced a series of examples inspired by the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism to help people understand how Islamophobia manifests itself. It's outlined clearly in our report and includes, amongst other things, calling for aiding, instigating or justifying the killing or harming of Muslims in the name of a racist or fascist ideology or an extremist view of religion, the tropes that Muslims suffer about entryism in politics, accusing Muslims of being more loyal to the alleged priorities of Muslims worldwide to their own nations, applying double standards not applied to any other group in society. But perhaps the best examples are those we published of real acts of Islamophobia within our own country. The attempted murder of a Muslim woman and her 12-year-old daughter as revenge for the Parsons Green terror attack. The torture of a Muslim convert by two women in Gisborough while they shouted, 
we don't like Muslims over here, and worse. The Muslim mother attacked for wearing a hijab on the way to collect her children from primary school in London. The so-called Punisher Muslim Day letters sent to Muslim institutions and prominent Muslim figures. The racists in Northern Ireland who left a pig's head on the door of the mosque they'd graffitied. The motorists forking out a thousand pounds more to insure their car if their name is Mohammed. The Social Mobility Commission's findings of conscious and unconscious bias against Muslims in the employment market. The Islamophobic abuse held at people who aren't even Muslim because their abusers couldn't tell the difference between, for example, a Sikh wearing a turban and a Muslim man. The men who tied bacon to the doors of the uh, handles of the doors of a mosque in Bristol. I'll certainly give that. I, I uh, commend my honourable friend for all of his hard work and his leadership on this um, uh, on this issue and for having yeah. secured uh, this important debate. Religious cr hate crime, as we all know, against our Muslim community has been on the rise in Britain and it needs to be tackled by the government and authorities. And as he just highlighted, with the Islamophobia definition, I want you to highlight the aspect of hate crime against those who are perceived to be Muslim. Uh, an infamous recent example was when a hate-filled individual felt the urge to try and remove the turban of one of my Sikh guests queuing up just outside our parliament and shouted, Muslim, go back home. Now, does my honourable friend agree that this needs to be further explored within the Islamophobia definition uh, and shows how we are all intertwined and need to stand together? Um, I, I strongly agree with my honourable friend. I thank him for the work he does supporting the all-party parliamentary group and I can reassure him that um, that kind of attack, that kind of prejudice is very much covered by our definition. And look, if we cannot recognise what is under our very noses, on the doorsteps of our own parliament, how can we give Muslims up and down the country, or those who are perceived to be Muslim, that we're taking this seriously? I'm grateful to my friend, and I, and I too want to commend him for the leadership that he has shown on this issue. Hate crime against Muslims has risen by almost 100% since the Brexit referendum. In my constituency, which is the biggest Muslim population of any constituency in Britain, nearly 90% of my constituents have either experienced Islamophobia or know someone who has. That includes bottles thrown at them, alcohol thrown at them, people screamed at for having the temerity to wear a hijab. But surely we need a better definition of Islamophobia if we're to prosecute Islamophobia and to clamp down on the enablers of Islamophobia in the British media. My, my right honourable friend uh, is absolutely correct and, and he is respected in this place for his deep knowledge of extremism issues which is why we invited him to give evidence to our inquiry. Look, the law already covers discrimination based on race and religion but what we're dealing with isn't just a challenge of changing laws, it's a challenge of changing hearts and minds and changing the everyday lived experiences of people in our community and helping people to recognise and understand the challenge. I thank him for giving way. He's making an excellent speech this afternoon. Does he agree that if we are to tackle Islamophobia and other hate crime, then we must ensure that the social media companies take that responsibility seriously? Just this week, I reported a comment which was following the report of a large Muslim gathering where somebody had put a pig's head and a dozen packs of bacon should do it. I reported that to Facebook. They replied very quickly saying it did not contravene their community oh, standards. Oh, oh. What does? If that doesn't contravene them, then what does? I hope they're listening today and they will reflect they on that. But does he agree with me that the social media companies and the written media need to do much more? Uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for that intervention. It's something I raised very recently with Facebook um, during a visit to their um, headquarters in, in Silicon Valley with the all-party parliamentary group on the fourth industrial revolution. It's something that must be taken seriously, as my honourable friend will tell us. I'm grateful to my honourable friend. I pay tribute to him for all his work on this, and indeed the honourable lady who brought who, who I know have championed this issue now over a number of years. On the point of social media, the government does have an online harms white paper that they're, they're consulting on at the moment. It isn't anywhere near robust enough in terms of online hate. It isn't anywhere near robust enough, in my opinion, on various levels of the impact that social media has across society. But on his point about how we change hearts and minds, social media companies can 
play a part in this, because rather than allowing the jokes and the hatred and the, and, the, and the assumptions about people's race and religion to be posted on social media companies, they could be far more robust, not just dealing with complaints, but being able to actually have the facilities of taking these images down, which often they don't do for days, just like, for example, in the Christchurch uh, mosque killings, where it took them over a day to remove those images from YouTube because they were reviewing the content. Um, I, I strongly uh, agree with my honourable friend, and I hope that's a point that will be taken up by ministers as they think about, about this issue carefully in their consultation. I'm extremely grateful to the um, to my honourable friend for, for giving way, but just still on the point of social media, does he agree also that we know that the, there is an excessive level of uh, hatred and abuse that is piled onto black and minority ethnic public figures on Facebook, Thank particularly you. Muslims, including the Mayor of London, who receives a oh, torrent of Islamophobic abuse, uh, uh, virtually all his pronouncements. And to reinforce the point that the social media companies have to be a critical part in this, we have to Absolutely. change the law, but all these partners have to be a part in making it work. Well done. Uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for that powerful point. The Mayor of London, my right honourable friend, the member for Tottenham, my right honourable fr uh, friend, the Shadow Home Secretary. There are many people in public life who are targeted because of racism. Racism, pure and simple. It has a gendered aspect, it has a religious aspect, and it's got to be recognised and tackled. Social media companies tell us they have the tools in place, they're clearly not using them, and I do think in part that is because they don't understand the prejudice that is plain as the nose on their face. Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and again I, I pay tribute to him for, for the work he's done on, on this issue. Uh, does he agree with me that what we need here is in, in clarity, and the definition is essential, because we can't have different degrees of racism. It is either racist or it is not. Exactly. And so if you start to question right. you know, the fine detail of, of a clear, concise definition of what is our Islamophobia, you then open the door for companies like the uh, social media platforms to then question what is and what isn't Islamophobia. And the government needs to be much clearer on this and much more firm. Uh, precisely, and, and let, me, let me make some progress now on, on that point. We toured the length and breadth of the country, engaging in extensive consultation with Muslim communities, with academics, lawyers, police officers, public services, civil society leaders and politicians, which is why our definition already has widespread backing, including over 750 British Muslim organisations, including the Muslim Council of Britain, Muslim Women's Network and British Muslims for Secular Democracy as well as the First Minister of Scotland, the Mayor of London and local authorities across the country, the Chair of the Government's own working group on anti-Muslim hatred. So it is particularly disappointing to see a noisy chorus of vocal opposition from many of the usual suspects making arguments in bad faith that accuse us of trying to use the term Islamophobia to shut down criticism of Islam and introduce blasphemy laws by the back door. In fact, our report makes it crystal clear that our definition does not preclude criticism of Islam or Islamic theology. I am not Muslim. I don't believe that the Holy Quran is the received word of God or that the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophets I recognise from my Bible or Jews would recognise from their Torah or many people would fail to recognise at all because Excellent. they think religious books belong in the fiction section Absolutely. of the local library. God if you believe in such a thing, does not need protection from criticism. Ideas must always be subject to debate and challenge. The motivations of some of our critics are particularly exposed when they accuse us of pushing a definition written for us by others, including Mend and Cage, two organisations that have pointedly refused to support our definition. And I would have thought it obvious by now that the right honourable member for Broxtow and I don't take kindly to being told what to do by anyone, let alone organisations with whom we have serious disagreements. So let me turn to some of the other concerns that have been expressed in good faith and reply in kind. Our definition does not cover sectarianism. From the abuse levelled to our Home Secretary from other Muslims on social media calling him a coconut, through to the treatment of the Ahmadiyya community with whom we are proud to engage through the work of our APPG. We recognise that sectarianism is a serious problem, one that extends beyond one religion, and it is worthy of separate consideration and action, just as the persecution levelled at so-called non-believers or ex-believers. And that is something which we must consider 
further and separately. Our definition does not prevent security and law enforcement agencies from recognising and fighting the threat posed to this country and other democracies by those who carry out acts of violence and terrorism with a warped view of Islam. Our definition does not prevent academics pointing out the religious motivation behind, say, the sieges on Constantinople or the caliphate's imposition of discriminatory taxes on Jews and Christians, just as we would discuss the role of Christianity in the Crusades. Our definition does not prevent critical discussion about the conflict that can arise between small-c conservative religious teaching and more liberal attitudes to issues like human sexuality, the role of women, food laws, abortion and assisted dying. And while, I, while the definition cannot prevent false flag accusations of Islamophobia to shut down reasonable debate and discussion, it does not enable such accusations either. In fact, understanding makes it easier to deal with such behaviour more easily. Context is everything. Our definition provides a framework for helping organisations to assess, understand and tackle real hatred, prejudice and discrimination. Will he, will he give way on that point? And I'm, I'm grateful because my honourable friend is making an outstanding speech and contribution to this very, very important discussion in this country at this time. Uh, when he raises the difficult issue of terrorism, and he could raise another very difficult issue of sexual grooming, does he deplore and condemn the way in which this most minority of sins that exist in every single ethnic group on the planet is being extrapolated to condemn an entire community and is that precisely what we are trying to get to grips with with this important definition challenging those that would take a terrible act by a small group of people and extend it to an entire ethnic group. I, I wholeheartedly agree. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. And you know, the story that isn't written and told is about the faith leaders in my community who don't just know the challenge posed by hate preachers, they have physically wrestled them out of their mosques. Yes. They're the same people who, when an act of terrorism is carried out in the name of one of the world's great faiths, not only deplore the attack, they know that they will be on the receiving end of the backlash, yeah. even though they believe their faith and the teaching of their religious texts to be about peace and about harmony. Um, I, I will give way one final time, then I, I must uh, draw my remarks to um, conclude. I only, I only intervene because he mentioned our Redbridge community and I want to pay tribute uh, to the Faith Forum and all the interfaith work and the Muslims who are involved in that in Redbridge have done a fantastic job. And will he agree that interfaith dialogue is at the essence of dealing with these problems? I, I wholeheartedly uh, agree and you know I'd say to my uh, honourable friend too uh, that as the discussion on Newsnight last night showed between myself and a very respected Imam from you Leicester. Were we can reconcile our way through some of these challenges and difficulties and tensions through mutual respect, proper public discourse and dialogue because those of us who are on the receiving end of prejudice of one kind or another know exactly what it feels like and we have a particular responsibility to stand alongside others who experience prejudice which is why I'm proud to lead the APPG on British Muslims as a non-Muslim, the APPG on British Jews as a non-Jew because it is not just the responsibility of Muslims to tackle Islamophobia, it is a challenge for us all. So let me conclude Mr Deputy Speaker with some personal observations. I have watched with some amazement and even greater despair the Conservative Party making exactly the same mistakes over Islamophobia within their party as my party has with anti-Semitism. The same miserable, inexcusable pattern of dismissal, denial and delegitimization of serious concerns raised by prominent Muslims about racism within their ranks. The extent to which my friend Baroness Varsi has stood as a brave lone voice challenging discrimination in her party. 
And if I just may say as an aside, Mr Deputy Speaker, as we recoil in horror at the deafening silence of decent people in the Conservative Party about racism within their ranks, I would respectfully say to some quarters in my own party, that is the same silence you demand of me, and it is a silence on anti-Semitism you will never receive. Theresa May could have followed the lead of the Scottish Conservative leader, Ruth Davidson, in backing this definition and left a powerful legacy to detoxify her party and improve the lives of Muslims across the country. Instead, with a remarkable lack of self-awareness and humility, the party that has so spectacularly failed British Muslims now intends to produce their own description. Their abject failure to understand and tackle Islamophobia within their own ranks means they have neither the wisdom nor the credibility to do so. Given that just over a year ago, government ministers denied there was a need for any definition at all, I suppose we might consider this latest development some sign of progress. But it is too slow, it is insufficient, and it will not be tolerated. British Muslims deserve better than this. And as the Runny Mead Trust said again last year, Islamophobia remains, shamefully in my opinion, a challenge for us all and one we must now meet.